everyone and welcome back. So I'm really pleased to be here with our good friend Paul Westover today. Hello. And Paul has come all the way from Brigham Young University in Utah to be with us for the last week. So I hope you've had a nice time. I have had an so excellent far. visit. And one of the reasons that Paul is here is because he has been very much involved in our This Girl Did project, which celebrates the bicentenary of Dorothy's walk up Scarfell Pike, um, which was yesterday. So today's the 8th of October as we're filming and the anniversary was on the 7th. Um, so this is a really nice time to be filming this with Paul today. Paul has been involved in the project but has also done a lot of work around Dorothy Wordsworth and this particular moment in her life um, prior to the project. So Paul is here today and we have one of the surviving copies of Dorothy Wordsworth's Scarfell Pike account in front of us just here. So I'm going to hand over to Paul who's going to introduce us to this letter and tell us a bit more about it. Good. Well, as we were trying to decide what object to talk about together, we selected this one, which is a little bit mysterious. Mm. Uh, I'll try to explain. So, as you've heard, Dorothy Wordsworth, her friend Mary Barker, went up Scofield Pike on October 7th, 1818. She seems to have been rather pleased with herself, for good reason. <laughs> yes, she these was. Two, these two middle-aged women went up the highest mountain in England. They were probably the first women ever to do it. I'd say so. Certainly the first ever to write about it. And anyway, she, she tells about this in a series of letters. And the most important one she writes two weeks after the event. And she wrote it to a family friend, a Mr. Johnson, who used to be schoolmaster here in Grasmere, but had since moved and taken a post in London. Unfortunately, that letter does not survive. Luckily for us, two copies of it do. So Dorothy copied the letter into one of her notebooks. That's not what we're looking at today. But then there's this other copy. And what we thought we'd do today is explain what we know about this document, but also what we don't know about it yet. So I'll share some of the research I've been doing and, and some of my speculations. And maybe someone out there in the world can help us advance this research yeah, that and figure good. out more about it. But here's what we know. It, it says uh, at the top of the page, and I hope you can see it, October 1818, and it starts straight in with a quotation mark. And so somebody is making a copy then of Dorothy's letter, and you can see it's in beautiful handwriting. Mm, absolutely beautiful. So it's a, kind of a fair copy, but this starts right in. I must inform you of a feat that Miss Barker and I performed on Wednesday the 7th of this month. So this feat, which she later calls an uncommon performance, she then spells out in great detail. So the question is, who made this copy? We don't know whose handwriting this is. Uh, we don't know who sent this letter, but there are some things that we do know. So if you can see this, the first thing you'll notice is that the handwriting is different. Yeah, it's quite drastically different, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, but the address panel says, Ellesmere, January 3, 1819, Miss Hutchinson, Hindwell, Radnor, and this seems to say Free Kenyon. Hmm. Right. So, these are all of the clues we have to go on in terms of where this particular copy of, of Dorothy's account came from. Now, Kenyon, this, this Free Kenyon bit seems to be a parliamentary frank. So if you were a member of parliament, you had the privilege to, s to send mail for free. And also, all of your friends usually used that as well. <laughs> yeah, well you would, wouldn't you? Yeah. But then the question becomes, who is this Kenyan fellow? Now, Wordsworth scholars might immediately think of a family friend whose name was Kenyon, who often appears in the letters. That does not seem to be the person. Mm. But we think we know who this is. We think this is uh, Lord Kenyon, who was an important uh, patron of educational reform in the country, among other things. But that still begs the question, how would he be connected with Dorothy Wordsworth of this whole circle? So here is where the story has several vectors and it's hard to tell a connected uh, story, but we'll, we'll do our best. So Mr. Johnson, family friend, former tutor of some of the Wordsworth children, mm -hmm. he's now working at the Central School in London promoting the Madras scheme <laughs> and so on. And, and he gets this letter that Dorothy writes in November, probably, or in October or November. And he is connected with Lord Kenyon through these educational projects. 
They also have a mutual friend who is sort of the founding figure in this educational scheme, who is a, a Dr. Bell. And Dr. Bell is also a friend of the Wordsworths and good friend of the Saudis who live up the road here in yeah. Kazakh. So all of these people are in each other's pockets uh, and visit each other and write to each other. So uh, Dr. Bell was the one who stole Mr. Johnson away from Grasmere, took him to London, uh, okay. and he is working closely with Lord Kenyon in setting up schools in different places and superintending them. Okay. okay. So I think what happens is this. The letter goes to Johnson in London. Johnson brings it with him when he comes north to visit Lord Kenyon. So I've been able to figure out through letters and biographies and some other primary sources that Johnson and Dr. Bell and Lord Kenyon were all together at Kenyon's estate at the beginning of 1819, or actually at around Christmas time, 1818, going into January 1819. Yeah. So this would have been the time, I think, that he would have then shared this letter okay. with the mutual friends. They all would have been delighted to have this characteristic piece of descriptive prose yeah. by Miss Wordsworth, which, you know, is delightful. I mean, yeah. if you've read the text, you'll see why people wanted to send it around and why it seems to have had a lively life as manuscript. Yeah. Um, though it later finds its way into print, and that's a story we could tell another day. Anyway, it, we still don't know then why the copy was made, and we also don't know why it was sent. So here's the other clue on the address panel. If you see here, it's sent to Miss Hutchinson Hindwell Radner. So Miss Hutchinson presumably is Sarah Hutchinson. Sarah yeah. Hutchinson, the close family friend, you know, Wordsworth's sister-in-law, right? Wordsworth is married to Sarah's sister Mary. Uh, they live at Hindwell in Wales. We know that when Dorothy and her friend were on the top of Scaffield Pike, they actually wrote letters to Sarah Hutchinson. And maybe these friends thought she had been tantalized by those scribbles from the <laughs> yeah. summit and would want to hear more. <laughs> yeah. But there's really no knowing why they decided to send it or who made the copy. Because this is not Kenyon's handwriting. We've been able to find samples of his handwriting and check. This is not Mr. Johnson's handwriting. Uh, we don't know whose it is. No. Now, our best theory right now is that this may be the handwriting of one of the clerks of these gentlemen, of, of Kenyon or Mr. Bell. We know that Mr. Bell had a clerk by the name of Thomas Davies, who was actually introduced to him by Lord Kenyon. So th the next step in our research is to go and try to find more samples of his hand to see if it might be a match. This would seem to be his finest clerical hand, you know. I have found one scribble of his on a dictated letter, but I think that's not a fair comparison. No. So some of the features seem to be similar, some of them don't seem to be. So do we have our man? Don't know. It may be that we'll never figure out whose handwriting this is <laughs> or why this was sent, but it's fun to think about. It's, it's fun to think about Sarah Hutchinson in general because she's kind of the shadow character yeah. in this whole story. They write to her from the summit. Um, years before, some viewers may remember Samuel Taylor Coleridge had climbed the neighboring mountain, Scafell. He seems to have been the first person to make a recreational ascent of that mountain yeah. and write about it. And he wrote all about it in a letter to Sarah Hutchinson, which then would have been passed around all yeah. the friends and family. And so to me, it seems highly likely that Dorothy is remembering that. I think that, so. That when, you know, Coleridge had said, you will call this letter when you receive it, the Scafell letter. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Dorothy now knows she's writing her own Scoffell letter, yeah, you yeah. know, and that, that if there's this conversation going on between the whole circle. Yeah. But the more pieces we can put together, the more full this picture will become, and maybe we'll come to understand where these pieces of paper actually came from and why they moved as they moved. So yesterday, Paul and a group of others did actually attempt to walk up Scarfell Pike to celebrate the bicentenary so they were following in Dorothy's footsteps exactly 200 years to the day that she made her ascent of Scarfell Pike and I thought it would be interesting to kind of talk to you a little bit about how how that was for you having read Dorothy's account and being so familiar with it then following in her footsteps and you know what did you find that was similar and what differences did you experience I think 
the weather was possibly the main yeah, one. Yeah, I was going to say, if, if I look exhausted today, <laughs> this, this is a clue as to how our day differed from the one she experienced. So when we imagine that day, we always, I think, picture these two middle-aged friends trudging up the mountain together in these sublime surroundings, which they absolutely are. Yeah. Just stunning. But actually, there were five people there on that day. We know that Mary Barker's neighbor, a shepherd statesman of the Vale, agreed to be their guide. That was me yesterday in my funny costume. <laughs> we know that they hired a man to carry their things. So an another friend of ours yesterday uh, took that role. And then Mary's indispensable maid, whose name we may have discovered, by the way. We're working on that piece oh of the my. puzzle as well. Oh. Um, so, so five people in all went up the mountain. and. Uh, the shepherd remarked, and, and this saying clearly stayed in Dorothy's head because she repeated it in two letters that she wrote. He said that he had never been on the mountain at any time of the year on so calm a day. He had never been so high in the mountains yeah. uh, on so calm a day. So it had been an extraordinarily warm summer that year, which was good because it was following two extremely cold years, yeah. wet years. Um, but the weather was starting to turn in the fall. It was starting to get rainy, but somehow when they went up there, it wasn't even windy. She said they ate their lunch up on the summit and the papers that their lunch was wrapped in didn't even blow in the wind. I mean, yeah. it must be like that so once a decade up there. Yeah, but I anyway, so. I've now been up there three times and it, the storm has hit me at the pass <laughs> every time and has been extraordinary. You know, yesterday we were in 50 mile an hour winds temperatures that probably felt below freezing with oh. the wind chill. So it was a very different day from the one they experienced. Yeah. So we, we were walking up, we were still trying to picture, you know, the things that, that she described so memorably. When we got up to the pass, I, I should say they weren't initially planning to, cl to climb no, this mountain. No, of course not. So, no. so the night before they were all at dinner with friends and their friends said, oh, we're going to go up Skidaw tomorrow. And then the I, I, the way I imagine it, the girls kind of looked at each other and said, yeah, we've got our own mountain <laughs> yeah, scheme for the morning. Thing. We'll do something better. So they said, we're going to go up to this pass called um, As Cause, which is a meeting place high on the mountains where uh, you can come in from the various valleys. Yeah. But when they get up there, the weather's nice. They feel good. They're energetic. And, you know, they're not tired. And they say, well, let's keep going, you know. And so they end up going up the highest mountain in England. So anyway... Along the way, we were trying to get photographs of the places they described, um, talk about the kinds of, of observations that she made. One of our colleagues, Joe Taylor, was noticing that she experienced the landscape in a different way wearing a bonnet mm. than she normally does, that it, that it enforced a kind of attention. And one of the things we notice about the account is that even though, of course, the summit views were stunning and she describes those. Uh, she's also very interested in details. Yeah. You know, she's looking at the lichens on the rocks. She's listening to the, the sound of the water. She's you know, always very attuned to her surroundings, yeah. Dorothy. That's one of the things we love about her writing. But yeah, of course. We, we wondered if that, that was part of it, you know, sort of the way you would experience the vision framed by a bottle. <laughs> I'm um, sure it would be. <clears throat> changed the way we looked at things. Yeah. Um, there was a place on that day, even though it was uncommonly warm in October 1818, when they had a little afternoon storm and they took shelter under some crags. And we think we may have identified the crags oh, wow. where we ourselves took shelter from the wind. <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> that they were a little bit slippery. It seemed like it would have been the yeah. right spot if between Escaz and the summit. Actually, they did it on their ascent. Yeah. Um, and we also got a rainbow yesterday. Wow. And one of the memorable things she describes is multiple rainbows, actually. And, yeah. And looking over Skidon and, and the distance to the north, and knowing that their friends were on that mountain and being so pleased that the weather had cleaned up and that they, they were enjoying their rainbows. Yeah. So anyway, that was quite moving when we had our rainbow yesterday. I bet it was. Huddled together in the cold. So no, I, th I think we all kind of had a chance to feel in our feet and in our bones what it was like to to follow that, that route. Uh, they essentially did a loop um, and the trails that are on the maps today honestly are, are the route that they took really um, partly because that's where the trail needs to go but partly because I think their route became immortalized and it has now been literally carved into the landscape by generations of feet mountain walkers yeah treading in their footsteps so how do you feel 
having done that walk, has that changed the way you feel about when you look at this, for example, when you look at this, this manuscript or an account of Dorothy's of the day, whether it's this one or the other version we have, do you feel differently about it? Well, I do remember the first time I read it, it was very hard for me to picture. Mm. And, and even as I began studying maps, you know, I was trying to put it together, but it's not the same thing as being there in 3D. No. Well, more than in 3D, right? In, in the soundscape and, and the wind moving your body and things. So it, it actually makes you appreciate, it, this, this sounds like a contradiction, but it makes you appreciate her more as a descriptive writer. Yeah. Because you realize that she was picking up on things that are, are, are sort of opaque, textually speaking, but, but on the ground are really quite vivid. Yeah. Um, and Dorothy's writing and her brother's writing as well are distinguished for being grounded in place yeah. in a special way. I think that's why the Wordsworth Trust is here. That's why pilgrims have been coming here for a long time because the words and the places seem to be intertwined in a way that's unique. So I do find now when I read these texts and I can picture the places and I've stood on those places, yeah, that all of a sudden they have a greater sense of know, depth, yeah. um, human reality, yeah. And you look at this 200-year-old piece of paper and think about uh, those people who were real people. Yeah, and they saw the same thing. Yeah, things. they're not they're not characters. Okay. And yesterday I got a chance to embody one of them literally. You know, <laughs> insofar as we could do that. Yeah. And. Yeah, I feel privileged to have been part of it. I think it, it's a day that none of us will forget. Well, thank you so much, Paul, for sharing your experience of the walk yesterday with us and also sharing your fascinating insights into this manuscript well, that we have. Well, thank you for inviting me and for hosting me this week. That's okay. I look forward to the next opportunity. Yes, we do as well. And if you want to come and see our This Girl Did exhibition, it's on until the 23rd of December, so there's still plenty of time to head on down to Grasmere and take a look where you'll see this manuscript and many more. So thank you for watching and we'll see you again next time. Bye for now. Goodbye.